how will I die? If I stay put, there will be no pain. I will finish typing this out and go into the kitchen to fix one last gin and tonic. I'll pop one last pill of Z into my mouth, wash it down with a cocktail and have a seat as the warmth rushes over me. I won't see them coming and I won't know how they do it. But it will happen mercifully quick, like flipping a light switch. And then there will be nothing. But if I run, it will take much longer and the pain will grow so large that it will claw through the calming embrace of the Z and fill my last moments alive with the sounds of my own anguished screams. The Miracle Rock The rock that fell one evening from outer space and landed in Andre Phillips' backyard didn't look particularly unusual, but it cured a man of cancer. Stricken with stage 4 lung cancer, Andre had been sitting on his back porch drinking a beer against his oncologist's advice, staring up at the sky, pondering his own death, when the object dropped down into the grass a few yards away from him. Right away, I felt it in my head, he later reported. Felt it all over, like I'd been purified, mind, body and soul. A second chance, a gift from God. Andre bought a special display case for the meteorite that had saved his life and kept it in his bedroom to pray beside every night. However, the miracle rock did not stay there for long, as a week after it landed in Andre's yard, it went missing, along with Andre himself. Before his disappearance, Andre had contacted a number of news outlets with the story of his miraculous recovery. Only one reporter had taken him seriously, and not for very long. When she followed up with the doctors who had treated Andre, they all denied that anything out of the ordinary had happened. They insisted that the cancer had not been that far advanced, which was a lie, and that, while rare, lung cancer was sometimes able to be cured if caught early enough. The reporter, though not very experienced, got the sense that the doctors weren't telling her the truth, and further, that they wanted to tell the truth, but something was preventing them. Still, there was nothing she could do, and her producer killed the story the day before Andre went missing, and so the public never heard the story of Andre Phillips and his miracle rock, and that was very much by design. Strange Elements The invitation was passed on through my former mentor, an old and distinguished professor. They had asked him for the best chemist he knew, and he had named me. Who they were wasn't entirely clear to him, nor was the exact nature of the project. But the man he had spoken to, who called himself the director of the project, had seemed deeply knowledgeable and with the easy access to deep resources. To demonstrate his resourcefulness, the director had apparently placed a tidy sum of money in my bank account without my knowledge. He says the money's yours either way, Sally, said my mentor over the phone. He says there's a lot more where that came from if you accept. And beyond that, a scientific mystery unlike the world has ever known plus a state-of-the-art lab to work through it in. Sounds pretty intriguing if you ask me. If I were 15 years younger, I'll be all over it myself. I was indeed intrigued, and so agreed to travel to Maine, where the research was to be conducted. The facility where I would end up living and working for the next three months was located in Brooks, Maine, a little township only a few miles off, bustling the coast but those few miles made all the difference between some semblance of civilization and the deep wilderness. After a drive down a long dirt road cut narrowly through a forest, I arrived there in my rental car. It lived up to all the cliches of a top secret research facility. There was a guard station in front of the gate with barbed wire on top. Beyond that, the building itself, looking cold and lifeless, juxtaposed before the rolling lush green hills. The guard there was conspicuously armed, 
I handed him my ID and looked up into the video camera that was glaring down at me. He let me pass and I drove onto the parking lot. There, a second armed man escorted me to the entrance of the building. I waited while he entered a code into the keypad, swiped his access card and finally proffered his eye for a retinal scan. When all of that was done, the door clicked open and we went inside and down a sterile hallway to a conference room. Wait in there, the man instructed, before clacking his way back through the hallway. I looked in through the open door to see a dozen eyes peering at me and stepped inside. We don't know what it is any more than you do, offered an attractive looking man leaning back in an office chair. In case you were wondering, he put me at ease somehow. I'm Sally Matthews, I announced. Chemist. Charlie Bohr, said the man. He smiled warmly. No relation to Niels, except I am a physicist with a special interest in quantum mechanics. Go figure. He says the exact same thing to every person who walks in the door, observed the woman sitting on the other side of the table. Are you saying that I'm a bore? Asked Charlie, raising an eyebrow. I have only myself to blame for that, said the woman, trying to suppress a grin. Anyway, Denise Chang. I study the stars. Nice to meet you, Sally. Stop me if you heard this one, said Charlie. A chemist, a physicist, and an astronomer walk into a secret research facility, along with a geologist, an oncologist, and a... Oh no. Sorry, Miles. I remember your name, but I'm drawing a blank on your field of interest. Psychology, said the man named Miles. Something about him weirded me out the moment I noticed him. Maybe because I was already so tense, and he had an icy demeanor, in stark contrast to Charlie's cheerful gregariousness. Right, said Charlie. A psychologist, of course. What project doesn't have a geologist and a psychologist working side by side? Those rocks, you know, lots of mother issues to work through. Miles looked down at his fingernails, and then up to an empty corner of the ceiling. The geologist opened his mouth to introduce himself, but he was cut off when another man entered the room, carrying a stack of hazmat suits. He set the suits on the conference table and said, Put these on, and then left. I never did find out the geologist's name, or the oncologist's. They were both gone within a week, and I never saw them again, either in the physical world, or what we came to call Z-World. Perhaps I'll see them again soon, in the afterlife. After we had suited up, somebody rolled a cart into the room. There was a small rock on the cart. It's a meteorite, said Denise, her voice sounding sharp and clear despite the coverings around her head and mine. I noticed that sound was coming in high definition from all around. I was suddenly aware of every little hum in the room and could pinpoint its precise location. The meteorite has special properties, I realized. Right now, it's somehow heightening my senses. They want us to figure out how that is and see if they can harness that power to their own ends. This meteorite has special properties, said the man who had wheeled the card in. It has cured a man of stage 4 lung cancer. It's your job to figure out what it is, how it did that, and what else it's capable of. Impossible, muttered the oncologist. I remember thinking, that guy's not going to last long. Charlie, Denise and I ended up getting along splendidly. We each did our work separately, but would get together later to talk about it. It was hard not to be excited. It was unlike anything any of us had ever encountered. It didn't take long for me to grasp this. On my first day of work, I ran an x-ray fluorescence analysis on a sample of the meteorite in order to determine which chemical elements it consisted of. On the first run, it was apparent that there was an abundance of nickel and iron in the sample, as Denise had told me to expect. But there were also two sets of energy peaks that didn't quite correspond to any known elements. 
One was close to the K-line of thulium, and the other one was close to the L-line of arsenic, but not quite close enough. It was a baffling result, especially since, as the director had promised, the equipment was state of the art. I ran a second test on the same sample, lowering the setting on the generator and increasing low end resolution. The same two unidentified sets of peak were there, but now nickel and iron were gone from the picture. In their place was titanium and zinc. It was as if, when I wasn't looking, the elements had suddenly changed into something else. The same thing happened on the third analysis, and on three more tests using a different sample. Finally, I used a different portable machine on the third sample, and it too returned the same results. The two sets of peak indicating an unknown element remained, while the other elements kept shifting their fundamental natures. After pursuing the possibility that I was looking at a completely novel chemical element, I realized that the energy peaks I was looking at would have to be coming from outer shell movements and that inner shell movements were literally off the charts. This would make the mystery element far heavier than any known element, which meant that it should have decayed in an instant. But it didn't. This novel element, if it really existed, would violate many of our most fundamental assumptions about physical science. And I found myself increasingly certain, much to my own surprise, that it did in fact exist and had come to Earth from outer space. Element Z For their part, Denise and Charlie were making progress in the same direction. That is to say, they were gathering evidence that we were dealing with something we had never encountered before in a way that cut to the marrow of our respective fields. Denise, for example, had been able to trace the meteorite back to the point where it had appeared seemingly out of nowhere. When I asked if that was just because it was small enough to evade satellite sensors, she assured me that we weren't talking about a point in space at the edge of the galaxy or even just outside of Mars. It was only a few thousand miles outside of Earth's atmosphere. It had just appeared there, and data from satellites were cross-checked and all told the same story. At the same time, she said there was every indication that the meteorite had come from very far away and had likely been created and propelled through space by a massive event that had occurred a very long time ago. This led to speculation on our part about wormholes or faster than light speed travel. Somehow, things that we had never given thought to in a long time, and maybe never gave serious thought to, became the frequent subjects of conversation and speculation. One day, while we were sitting at a cafeteria table eating bland food, Charlie summed up his thoughts like this. Reality would rather blow itself up than change. And when it does change, it blows itself up beforehand anyway, I guess as sort of a protest. But that's not what's happening here. You've got protons hopping from bed to bed like swingers on a Saturday night. Usually when that happens, something goes boom. And that atom of yours, Sally, same deal. That thing should be as unstable as a swinger on a Saturday morning after a coke binge. But it's not. What are you calling it anyway? The Atom? I had in fact thought of a name. Z, I said. I'm a periodic table kind of girl, and since we don't know the number, I've been calling it by the stand-in for the atomic number, Z. That's very charming, said a flat voice from behind me. I turned and saw that it was Miles, the psychologist. Element Z, I rather like that. After speaking, Miles walked off, disappearing into the hallway. Jesus, that guy gives me the creeps, said Denise, echoing my thoughts exactly. What's he even doing here? I found out a partial answer to Denise's question the following day, when I received a message on the internal server instructing me to report to Miles's office at 4 that afternoon. It was the first of what would be mandatory bi-weekly sessions with Miles. I would sit there for an hour, my skin crawling almost the entire time, while he probed me with questions. For the most part, they were fairly straightforward, 
about how I was feeling on a day-to-day -day basis. And my discomfort was mainly due to Miles himself, who I came to think of as somehow reptilian. But he would also always throw in a few questions that chilled me directly. Sally, if it meant saving many lives and progressing the common goals of humanity, do you think you have it in you to slit Charlie's throat in the night while he slept? Suppose Denise grew jealous of you in some way and attacked you from behind with a heavy object. Would you be able to neutralize her? I don't mean physically. I mean, would you have the psychic fortitude to kill somebody who meant to kill you? Or, tell me about your sexual fantasy, Sally. Whom do they involve? Are you sexually attracted to anyone at this facility? Those questions made me deeply uncomfortable, but I wasn't sure what to do about them. So I always gave non-committal answers and tried to change the subject. There was no HR department to complain to. By then, it was just the four of us, Charlie, Denise, Miles, and me, living there together. There was a small kitchen staff and a custodial staff, and of course, the armed guards who prowled the halls at all times. Somehow, I felt that they were in there to help me. And then, there was the director, wherever and whoever he was. But the director was the one who insisted that we all have sessions with Miles twice a week. I got the sense that complaining to him via the internal server would get me nowhere except maybe off the project, which was the last thing that I wanted. As high as God. I came under mounting pressure to produce results. That was the word that the director used in his communications with me, and it meant that he wanted me to get element Z into a form where one of the four of us researchers could ingest it. He insisted that it be one of us, since we were the only ones who knew the details surrounding the project. This is far outside the scope of the FDA, Sally, he wrote one day. To tell the truth, that wasn't the part that bothered me. I was ready to go all the way with my exploration including swallowing a pill of Z without knowing what exactly it was, without having the faintest idea about what it was. I also had an almost mystical confidence that such a pill by itself would do no harm. After all, I had experienced some of its effects simply by being near it already, and had heard the story of how it had cured a man of cancer. The difficult part was that I couldn't physically separate element Z out from the other elements, which were often toxic to people and could be lethal in the doses required to carry with them even a trace amount of Z. I couldn't separate the elements from each other, because I never knew which elements I was supposed to separate. They were in constant flux, the atoms always transmuting. It was an intractable problem. Until Charlie had made a breakthrough one day. He laid it out over the lunch table. You ladies know what an interference pattern is? when two or more waves cross each other's path and so create a new pattern of peaks and troughs. Sure, said Denise, popping a tater tot in her mouth. What about it? I took the liberty of charting out some of Sally's data this morning. And best I can tell, element Z is emitting a constant series of interfering energy waves that is somehow responsible for which other elements turn up at the time of measurement. Using the wave function, one can calculate the probability that any given sample of the meteorite will contain, say, arsenic and lead at any given time. Thought that might be useful to work out, no? I wanted to kiss him. I can work with that, I said. And I did. Now that I had a set of probabilities to work from, I was able to devise a method of separating the chemical elements from one another that, while doomed to fail 99 times out of 100, would strike gold on that 100th time, or rather, would strike element Z. By the end of the week, I had a pile of the stuff in powder form, free of impurities. From there, I discovered that the substance was soluble in water. I also knew, according to Charlie's chart, that the lighter elements like carbon and oxygen were outside of element Z's wave function, which meant that I was able to safely combine it with sugar. 
And so, I was able to easily create a pill that contained only a single nanogram of element Z. It was decided that we would hold an impromptu drug trial in Miles' office. I protested to no effect. And so, the four of us gathered together early one morning to draw straws. The short straw would take the pill. I felt emotion in both directions. My curiosity was at a fever pitch, and I wanted to be the first person to test the drug. But I also felt a deep fear gnawing at my stomach. The fear of being launched so completely into the unknown. Miles wasn't helping ease my discomfort. He sat icily behind his desk and showed no emotion. Behind him was a video camera set up on a tripod. I felt, somehow, like that camera had more humanity in it than Miles did. I wished that he would just leave the project altogether. We drew straws and Charlie came up short. Hell yeah, baby, he said. He immediately plucked the pill up from Miles' desk popped it into his mouth and swallowed it with the pull from his water bottle. Blast off! Miles pushed the button on the video camera, and then we waited. I'm higher than a Georgia pine, said Charlie ten minutes later, grinning. Oh fuck, that feels good. Like ecstasy. MDMA. But like times a hundred. You're experiencing intense feeling of well-being, asked Miles, scribbling in his notebook. Charlie looked at Miles with pupils that nearly crowded out his irises entirely. Well, I was, dude. Until you started talking. Why don't you give me a few minutes alone with the ladies, huh But He laughed. No, no, I'm just kidding. Sort of. Man, I'm horny. Write that down, Miles. The subject is horny as hell. I had to admit that I was feeling rather heated too. It was like Charlie was emitting a raw animalistic sexuality. I wish that I had the proper equipment to measure his hormone levels. In fact, I wished that I had any equipment to measure anything. As far as trials went, it was shoddy work, but I reminded myself there would be more trials. Wait a fucking second, said Charlie. Then I heard him, inside my head. Sally, can you hear me? Don't answer out loud. Listen, I'm here. I promise that I won't look at anything that I'm not supposed to. But I want you to know I can see inside of your mind. I can enter it like a room and look around. Don't say anything. I can't get inside of Miles' head for some reason. And I don't want him to know about this. Not yet anyway. Not until you and I can talk about it with Denise. I'm there, inside of her mind too. I'm fucking everywhere. Sally. I'm as high as God. Hooked. The next day, I made a badge of pills and Charlie, Denise and I gathered together in my room after work to take them. My hands shook as I brought the pill to my mouth. I knew that it would feel wonderful, but I was also terrified at the prospect of having an experience so far outside of anything I had ever known. I began to feel the effects 10 minutes after taking the pill. A rush of warmth coursed through me, along with a feeling that everything was exactly how it was supposed to be, and that it was also beautiful. My chest swelled with contentment. A restless energy took over my body, but I also had the sense that I could sit still and do absolutely nothing and be completely happy. This is amazing, said Denise, pacing around the room. Fucking amazing. Just you wait, said Charlie, smiling. He was so beautiful. So was Denise. There it is, said Charlie, inside my mind. I was there, in his too, and Denise was there with us both. We were physically entangled, and then, before very long, we all took each other's hand and settled down on my bed to become physically entangled. 
we explored each other all night. In pure bliss, body and mind. Each caress felt deep in our souls. Each moan sounding lovelier and more nuanced than a Mozart symphony. After that, there was no going back. In the morning, there was no physical hangover. There was only a sense of loss in returning to our ordinary senses. And so we took another pill before heading off to go about our work. On Z, everything was better, including our work. I hardly needed the high-tech equipment in the lab anymore. I could see the energy waves emanating from the meteorite samples with my own eyes. When I was close enough to the samples, I could feel what it was like to be hurtling through space at unknown speeds. I saw glimpses of deep space far beyond the edges of our galaxy, and perhaps near the very edge of the universe or beyond. It was a strange place, an endless void spotted with occasional pockets of intense energy twisting around on itself, coming into existence, becoming existence itself. We took Z every day. We would go to work, then meet in the cafeteria at lunch, where we sat silently, eating, communicating telepathically. Even the drab food tasted wonderful, and we savored every bite. Then, back to work. And finally, we would meet in somebody's room to make love all night. A few days into it, we were at the lunch table, discussing Charlie's progress on faster than light speed travel when the niece interrupted the conversation. Creep alert, she said. I could feel it too. A cold presence in the hallway, getting closer. Miles. He was like a dark spot in our joy. Every other person, down to the security guards carrying their loaded weapons, was beautiful to us. Their insecurities, their desires, their kindness and cruelties, they were all evident to us, like an open book and we came to view them all as perfect creatures, exactly as they were supposed to be. But Miles was something else. He was closed to us, and we trusted him less than ever before. I would like to try a pill, Sally, said Miles, now standing behind me. I know you three have been taking it, and are on it right now. I'd like to try it for myself. The director has requested my first-hand account of it as well. No way can we let him have this, said the niece. Can you cook up some MDMA and give him that? He won't know the difference. I'll have to make one up for you, I said. After lunch, okay? Excellent, said Miles. Bring it by my office if you would be so kind. After all, it's Tuesday and you'll be coming by anyway right? I'll see you at 4 o'clock, I said. Just go away, Miles, said Denise. You're a frightening thing. Very well, said Miles, stalking off towards the hallway. Later that day, I brought Miles an MDMA pill that I had produced and sat down for my interview. I was still a little high on Z and it was my first interview in that state. Thank you, Sally, said Miles putting the pill in a drawer. Let's begin. If I told you that Charlie and Denise weren't really your friends, would you believe me? No, I said without hesitation. I wouldn't. They're my friends. And if they try to kill you, would you still consider them friends? They would never try to kill me. I understand, but that doesn't answer my question. Why would they try to kill me though? That matters. Sometimes killing somebody is a mercy. Interesting, said Miles, scribbling in his notebook. Very interesting. So, if they had a good reason to kill you, you would find that acceptable. I shrugged. I don't know, Miles. I don't know what to tell you. You've done well, Sally. Thank you. That's it for today? That's it. I left the room hastily, feeling queasy. Something about that meeting, and Miles in general, cut through all of the warm feelings of Z 
and left me in a state of panic. I went straight back to my room and locked the door. I didn't want to see anybody, I just wanted to feel good again. So I took two more pills of Z. I felt Charlie and Denise approaching my room. I didn't want to see them and realized that I could hide from them. I could cloak my mind so they wouldn't know where I was and in this state I could still look in their minds. Can you feel her? Charlie asked Denise. No, she's not in her room. God, I wonder what happened. Do you think Miles did something to her? She's probably in her lap working, said Charlie. I guess she wants to be alone right now. We should respect that. Come on, let's you and I go back to my room. I felt their presence receding down the hallway. An hour or so later, I felt their presence again. Can you feel her? Charlie asked Denise. That's when I realized that Z could show me the future. The Director Five pills I soon discovered were too much to take at once. The body would shut down before the Z could show the mind what it had in store. The human mind was not equipped to glimpse such mysteries and to protect itself, the body convulsed and shut the mind down too. That's how Charlie and Denise found me, with my eyes wide open, staring at the lab ceiling in the depths of a seizure. After I had recovered, I decided to tell them what I had experienced. Two pills at once showed me the future. Three pills at once let me leave my body and travel the corridors of the facility. And four pills brought me to the Z world. In Z world, it was as if I were floating above a three dimensional game board. I could travel down to different places at different times the past, the present, or future and observe everything going on there. I could enter people's minds if I wanted and see the hidden energy waves all around us like a shimmering rainbow. My range of travel was limited. I could go further back in time than I could go forward, and I could only go to places with a few hundred miles radius. But it was an incredible, unheard of power. My friends admonished me for so recklessly putting myself in such danger without telling them, but admitted that they wanted to enter Z-World for themselves. Not right now though said Denise. You have to rest up, Sally. You look like you're on death's door. Charlie and Denise stayed with me the rest of that day and all of the next. I had planned on abstaining from Z, but the withdrawal was too intense. Again, it wasn't a physical withdrawal, but rather a feeling as if the world had suddenly closed up and you were no longer a part of it. It was like a living death. And so, I was permitted a half a pill just to regain equilibrium. We decided to drop four pills each that weekend. It was difficult to get through the week. Even taking one whole pill didn't quite do it for me anymore. Sure, it felt good, but nothing compared to that feeling of near omniscience. Meanwhile, while we waited, we spent our lunch breaks and after hours talking about something we'd never talked about before what exactly we were doing there and what exactly were the implications of unlocking the power of Z. It cures cancer, I said one day to get the conversation going. It grants the power of telepathy and lets you see the future. What's going to happen with these powers? Are they going to be released to the public? For free? Would that be a good thing or not? And if they're not going to be released to the public, then who will hold them? And to what ends? We need to find out who the director is, said Denise in response. Is he part of the government? The military? Is he a venture capitalist? If we can find out who the director is, that will answer a lot of our questions. Something tells me we're not going to like the answer, said Charlie. Think about it. The first time we heard about this thing and the fact that it can cure cancer was right here. What about the guy whose cancer was cured? How come he didn't tell the story to everybody he knew? How come it wasn't plastered all over the nightly news? Because 
somebody wanted to suppress the story because somebody was able to suppress the story. By the time the weekend came around, we had a plan. The sensation of entering Z-World was terrifying if you weren't expecting it, and even if you were. You went from feeling every nerve in your body lit up with pleasure, to feeling yourself being pulled away from yourself. It was like your brain was being pulled apart into two aspects, the physical one that regulated body functions, and the extra physical one where consciousness lived. You were split in two, and felt yourself lifting up even as you knew that you were still sitting. The three of us met in the clouds, high above the research facility, looking down on the sprawling hills of Brooks, Maine. The plan was to travel back to the place in time where the meteorite had first landed, which information Denise knew well. We reasoned that if we followed news of the meteorite's landing, we would eventually run into the director. Focus, I said. Repeat the coordinates and the time over and over again, together. We did this and soon found ourselves on a porch next to a man who was drinking a beer and staring up at the sky. He was thinking about all of the mistakes he had made in his life and all of the people he'd hurt and how much he wished he could make it alright. About how it was impossible to do that, but there was time enough to maybe make a few things right. That was all he wanted. The meteorite fell and we sensed the change in him right away. We knew what it was, but he didn't. We stayed with him that night and followed him to the hospital the next day. There we split off. I went back with Andre Phillips to his home while Denise and Charlie stayed at the hospital and traced the news as it spread among doctors. The whole time I was with him, I could feel the utter joy pouring out of Andre. He truly did view his cure as a second chance at life and made good on his plans to make amends wherever he could. He was a beautiful soul, and a lonely one, and I ached for him the entire week I followed him. On the last night of Andre's life, Charlie and Denise appeared next to me in Andre's room. It's Miles, said Charlie. Miles is the director. He's part of a secret military branch involved in developing mind control techniques, among other things. And he's here, now. We watched, helpless to change anything, as Miles crept into Andre's room and smothered the man with a pillow. Power Trip When we came back to our bodies, Miles was sitting there, in my room, swirling a glass of scotch around. I tried, as I had many times, to penetrate Miles' mind, and was met only with a cold spot. That was when I realized, That's right, Sally. I've been on Z since the day you figured out how to make it ingestible. He smiled and took a sip of scotch. You could all be dead, you know. It would have been very easy, at any time. Truly, I don't need anything more from you. I have Z. That's quite enough. So, why are we still alive then? Asked Charlie. Well, despite what you think, I'm not a monster. What the three of you managed to achieve is remarkable. I'm not one to steal the fruits of someone's labor without due compensation. So, here is the offer. If you stay here and see if you can extract anything else useful from this substance, then you will have a lifetime supply of Z, regardless of if you manage to make further discoveries or not. But you must never tell anyone about anything remotely related to Z. That's the offer. And if we refuse? Asked Denise. What do you think? Said Miles. He took another sip of scotch. What are you going to do with it? I asked. Will you release it to the world? Nothing too dramatic. It will serve United States interests. And no, the world will never know it exists. It can cure cancer, I said. Surely that's in the interest of the United States. We can't have the public going around reading each other's minds, Sally. We can't have people knowing that's possible. 
Maybe there's a way to separate out the effects, said Denise. Maybe we can cure cancer without the mind reading. Then stay and work on that, said Miles. I didn't need to be a mind reader to know what Miles was thinking. But even if we could do that, you would never allow it into the world. Because somebody could take the cancer drug and work from there to produce a mind reading drug. Miles scowled. It was the first time I had seen any trace of emotion on his face. It's your choice. Stay here and get high and fuck each other all day. Or die. His face relaxed back into its default icy posture and he stood up. Discuss it among yourselves if you must. Meanwhile, I have other business to attend to. Miles left, but the tension remained heavy in the room. Denise and Charlie had closed their minds off from me. Sally, said Charlie, there's nothing we can do about it. Just stay with us. We can have a lot of fun. You're on a power trip, Sally, said Denise. You want to save the world, but can you even be sure that the world would be better off if there was widespread access to Z? Haven't we talked about this? We just don't know what would happen. I blocked off my own mind. I suppose you're right. I said, yes, I'll stay, but that doesn't mean I'm happy about it. I need a little time alone to process it all, okay? Just a day or two alone in my room to make peace. Tell Miles, okay? Tell him I'm on board, but need some time off. Charlie took my hand. I understand. I don't feel great about it either, but it's the right call. The only call. Then, they left me alone. To hatch. My escape plan. How I will die. I had to train myself to act without thinking. It was not easy. I practiced in front of the bathroom mirror. By say, clipping my fingernails while thinking about something else. I picked up my clothes without thinking about them and got dressed that way too. By the end of the second day, I was not at all certain that I had actually achieved my ends. But I knew that my time had run out. I had to open my mind back up, or the others would grow suspicious. During the day, I squirreled away pills of Z in my lab coat. I would eat lunch with Charlie and Denise as usual, and then meet up with them after work for our usual erotic routine. They were thrilled that I had apparently accepted my life together with them. The escape itself was trivially easy. One night, I waited until Denise and Charlie had collapsed from exhaustion, and then crept out into the hallway. There were three guards on duty inside the building, and I knew where each one was and what they were thinking. I waited until one of them was isolated and then snuck up behind him and injected him with a 5 nanogram solution of Z, enough to put him out of commission. I carefully dragged his body to the entrance. I knew the code well enough, and after swiping his access card, I only had to lift his head up and point his wide open eyes at the retinal scanner. I knew from floating above it that there was a gap in the fence surrounding the facility. It led out into the forest, where I would have to make a long journey through the hills. As soon as I crawled under that gap and into the dark night, I was struck by two certainties. First, that I was free. And second, that I would soon be dead. In every future I have seen, I am murdered. There is no escaping it. This course I've been on now is the one where I live the longest. I also know that this is the only channel through which I can tell the world about Z. I won't be alive to know if you'll believe me, or if you'll be able to do anything about it. I only know that any channel other than telling the public directly is closed off by Miles' far-reaching stranglehold. My mentor, the one who initially reached out to me about the project, has gone missing. In an hour, I will be dead. How exactly I die is my choice. After I finish typing this, and send it out, I can go into the kitchen of this little cottage and mix myself a gin and tonic. 
I will pop one more pill of Z and feel the warmth rush over me. They'll come in, somehow, and kill me quickly. My guess is that it will be a bullet to the back of my head. Or I can run. If I do that, a dark blue RAV4 will ram into the side of my little Civic. The impact of the crash will crack several of my ribs and set shattered glass flying against my face. I will play dead. Charlie will exit the RAV4 and open my door to douse my corpse with gasoline. I will stab him in the gut with a kitchen knife. He won't see it coming, because in his vision of the future, I'm already dead from the crash. He will stagger back and I'll leap out of the car, through the pain, and grasp Denise around the neck. I'll strangle her as hard as I can, but before I can kill her, Charlie would have pulled a knife from his stomach and will bring it down into my back again and again. I will roll off of Denise and look up at them, unable to stop myself from screaming in pain as blood pours out of my mouth. My last moments of life will be filled with pain and anguish unlike I've ever felt. But before I die, I will look into the eyes of my former friends. And I will see misery there, guilt and doubt and despair. They will have to face up to what they've become. I will know. And then it will all go dark for me. The Civic is gassed up and ready to go.